question. It's a project that probably should be able to be bipartisan moving forward. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate your uh, service and the information you're providing this morning. Uh, just following up on Senator Murphy's uh, question, uh, th there is a perception that side effects, adverse effects uh, from the vaccine uh, are not being gathered, that they're not being uh, made available to the public. Are the side effects and adverse effects, uh, Dr. Walensky, uh, being captured? Are they available to the public? Is there a place we can go to see what the likelihood is of various side effects based upon getting a, a, a vaccine? We have the most robust vaccine safety system than we have ever had in this country in the rollout of the va this vaccine. Our vaccine adverse events reporting system, as Senator Murphy just described, has over 600,000 reports publicly available. We have a new vSafe system, which is developed specifically for the COVID-19 vaccine program. It uses a text message system, web surveys to get people to provide their symptoms after they've been vaccinated. It includes over 9.5 million people and over 12.5, 12 million in health surveys. We have a pregnancy registry where we um, uh, survey pregnant women. We are, are um, getting their information during their vaccine, after their vaccine, in their first trimester. We call them in their second trimester, their third trimester, after their baby is born, and at three months. We've registered over um, 5,000 women in that, and we have over 24,000 who have been contacted. And we have a vaccine safety data link, which is a collaboration with our academic uh, institutions, which includes over seven and a half million people who initiated vaccination. This is the most robust vaccine safety system that is, that's ever been documented. And, and where might the public go to see what the probability is of various side effects or adverse effects from the vaccination? Uh, on our CDC website. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Fauci, a number of us are concerned about mandates, obviously. Um, uh, the, the question, and I sent you a text just to uh, prep you for the question, but the, the question in this regard is, um, uh, if we do have a mandate, and I'm thinking now of the mandate for private companies, if we do have a mandate, uh, will it save lives? And is there an estimate of, of the number of lives that might be saved by virtue of having our uh, private companies that have over 100 employees, uh, either having their employees uh, receive a vaccination or get a weekly test? If, if that occurs, will it save lives? And do you have an estimate of the number of lives it might save? I have a very firm and confident answer to your first question, Senator. And I don't have one of your second, but let me just explain very briefly. We know that vaccines absolutely save lives. And we know that mandates work. If you look at, for example, the percentage of people in United Airlines or in the Houston Medical Association or in other organizations that have mandated, it works 99 plus percent, for example, with United Airlines. So if you take the fact that mandates work and vaccines absolutely save lives, the answer to your question is yes, it does save lives. How, what that number is, you'd have to do modeling, Senator, that I don't have in front of me right now to determine when people get vaccinated in a certain area, what is the chance of their having gotten infected and given their underlying condition, what's the chances of their having died or not? That information can likely be modeled, but I don't have that for you right now. Yeah, I, I would think that given the information you do have, if you extrapolate from the information you have as to where mandates have been imposed, such as United Airlines, uh, and, uh, and you apply it, you can calculate what the number of lives saved might be. I would think that would be helpful to, for me and for others who are uh, concerned about mandates. Uh, we're also concerned about lives lost and right. protecting uh, human life. Um, we also had a, a question from Senator um, uh, Kane about the, uh, uh, the long haulers, if you will, the long COVID. Uh, how serious are these long uh, uh, haul uh, cases? Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, what proportion of those that, that have COVID, do you have a sense, do we know yeah. the number? What proportion of those that have, that have had COVID are subject to, if you will, serious uh, long COVID conditions? A very good question, Senator, that we are now actually finding out more definitive data. There have been a number of published papers from different smaller cohorts. We're now putting a massive cohort study. And among the smaller cohorts, it ranges from 10 to up to 30, 35% of people have varying degrees of 
prolonged symptomatology following the so-called resolution of the acute disease. Some of them can be relatively minor, but some of them can be incapacitating. For example, there are some individuals who have truly incapacitating fatigue, where they were pretty healthy, athletic, and then following COVID, they never get back to their baseline. There are sleep disturbances, there are a thing called brain fog, which can be very disturbing to people where they can't focus or concentrate. So the spectrum is wide. It can go from something that just is modestly bearable to something that incapacitates you. And that's the reason why we have this study right now looking at it that's about a $1.5 billion investment to try and sort that out. I would just note, I know my time is up, but I would just note that it would be helpful for those of us that are concerned about our children or grandchildren to have a sense not just of the number of deaths associated with, uh, with COVID in, in children, but also the number of long COVID cases, severe long COVID cases, because it would be my estimate that that probably substantially exceeds uh, the number of deaths among young people. And that information, I think, would be helpful for parents and grandparents like myself. Thank you. Senator Hickenlooper. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, once again, I want to thank each of you for your, not just for your testimony today, but for all the work that you have done over this entire, and it is a campaign.